So maybe the, the trend of the, well, the, the talk is about implementing Cloud Foundry right into the middle of an existing data center. Jürgen and I just want to talk the experiences we had about doing this approach, which is a little bit different from the other approaches where Cloud Foundry is implemented as an island just beside uh, the existing stuff to, to make a lot of innovation there and the old uh, installations are left behind. Um, maybe we introduce ourselves very shortly. My name is Andreas Landenberger. I worked more than 20 years for IBM before I joined Dativ in 2009. Since, since then, I'm working on developing our platforms at Dativ, and my mission is to build a very good platform for our future applications and to make this future proof. Yeah, welcome everybody from me. My name is Jürgen Susner. I work for Dativ for about 12 years now. I was once a Java JE developer. I was five years a WebSphere admin, and for two and a half years, I'm building together with Andreas the Dativ cloud platform right in the middle of the Dativ data center. OK. Maybe first, it makes sense that we introduce Dativ to you. Dativ is a cooperative. Uh, the main reason for founding Dativ is in the quote here below. The idea was to tackle as a group what each of us would not have managed on their own. This is the mission of our founder, and this is very important for all we do at Dativ. So we are there to, for, for, for the uh, benefits of our, the members of Dativ. We are not a company which is making a lot of money for shareholders. We are, are supporting our members. And this is also something which goes right down to the decisions we sometimes make at Dativ. Um, these long-term investments we see at Dativ um, sometimes help us a lot because we are not driven by quarters, but sometimes they also hinder us because we as Dativ, as a company, always have to be very careful not to get into economic um, in, uh, interests together with our members to collide with their interests. At end users, for our applications, we do not only have the, the Dativ members, but we also have a lot of clients of the Dativ members. More than 100,000 small and medium-sized companies at Germany are collaborating over the Dativ data center with their tax advisor and their lawyers. So this is very important for the business we are running. So the, the Dativ data center is the collaboration platform for these things. Now, if we talk about the Dativ data center, what are, is the main information here? On the one hand side, the Dativ data center, we have mainframes, we have uh, AIX systems, Unix systems, big ones, and we have thousands of Windows and Linux servers. Uh, all of this is spread out over three data centers we have in Nuremberg in Germany. And these three data centers are coupled via fiber channels. Uh, from the business side of view, uh, this platform is used, uh, for example, to generate more than 30 million pay slips each month and to process all the payments of this. Uh, it is used to store more than 750 electronically stored documents which are exchanged between the clients of the tax advisors, for example, and the tax advisor, so that the tax advisor can do the booking on it. And this data center also does all the electronic processing between um, a tax advisor or a small and medium-sized company and all the uh, revenue um, institutes in Germany to determine state to pay taxes, all the social insurance companies, and so on. So there's a lot of data processing there. Now, why do we need a Dativ, such a cloud platform? What is the driver behind this? First, let's take a look backwards. How are applications at Dativ being developed? In the old days, we had a developer here who was, uh, who was isolated from the internet. So in an air gap network, they had no direct access to the internet, and they used Artifactory to 
to get in some packages they need to develop. The developer built his application using Git, deployed it via Jenkins on the development stage. To do this, he had to get into contact with the administrator of the development stage because here we had a, also a barrier between development and operations, the typical scenario we see in many customers. If you want to get further, he had to use the Dativ proprietary tool to deploy it on the QA stage and also to production. In all these steps, the administrator was always involved. So he had, the administrator had to allocate uh, JE data sources and all these things. You know, there was a lot of emails going back and forth and deployment things and so on. Uh, now, we, uh, what drove us that we said we need cloud technology at Dativ. Uh, the point is that the developer productivity is one important thing. We wanted the developers to be more productive. The, 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 we want to get rid of all this communication going on. Uh, the other point was uh, we wanted to build self-sufficient teams, which meant a lot of uh, isolation also into the cloud platform. We wanted that, that development team A could not interfere with development team B. Uh, we wanted to give the developers self-services, and simple st process steps and full access also in development, QS, and production of their applications. And if you look into the future, even now, going ahead, the point is that we wanted to have a platform which could be used as a base for Dativ ecosystem, where partners of Dativ would be able to implement their platforms also on. Now, is this enough to think about a platform and to choose a platform. In our opinion, this is not enough. Uh, we, in 2016, we evaluated uh, platforms like the Docker ecosystem, we evaluated OpenShift and, and looked at Azure as a precursor of Azure Stack and so on. And finally, we said we have a set of criteria each of the platforms have to fulfill when we build it at Dativ. The first thing is the platform has to be widely adopted. We do not want to only uh, put our efforts into the platform of one provider. The second thing is uh, we want to have the platform to be polyglot, which means uh, the platform has to not only support the latest Java stuff, we want to have support for languages like, for example, PHP and so on, but also for uh, the point of to run Windows 16 applications. This is very important for us because Dativ has a long history and a lot of applications and business logic and developers which come from the Windows area. We have a lot of desktop applications and we want the possibility to take this intelligence and logic to bring it to run on our platform. And the second important point was you had to be run in a data center, private data center, air gap. For Dativ, due to the sensitivity of the data we are processing, it's no option to go to public clouds. And after evaluating all these points and making tests on various systems and various implementations, we ended up using Cloud Foundry for this. Okay, now Jürgen will take over and guide you what we did to make Cloud Foundry happen in our own air gap data center. Thanks. We first had a talk. I will do the fun part now, the technical stuff. Um, well, as we mentioned, security is really important for Dativ. And the first thing we have to consider about the cloud platform is how to separate different workloads within a cloud platform. To illustrate that, I will highlight what are the different types of workload we have. We have this, this public workload. You don't have to authenticate for. You get information from a Dativ website. This is public workload everyone can access. You have medium secure workload, we call it. It's the type of workload uh, which a Dativ shop, some Beispiel offers, uh, for example, offers. If you have, if you would uh, shop for material, for products, and all that stuff. And we have that high sensitive data the customer gave us through the payroll processing to do the invoices and all that stuff. And the first challenge was to separate these workloads. And the solution was it as isolation segments. We heavily use isolation segments in Cloud Foundry to separate these types of workload so that an, that an application that do, does payroll processing never gets the possibility because it's network technically segmented and separated from the other one. We don't mix and match public and secure applications on the same Diego cell. But self-service and isolation segment 
well, it does not match. Because if you want to assign an isolation segment, you have to have admin privileges. And we solved this by creating a service in the marketplace. We predefined four isolation segments in the platform, and we created a self-service marketplace service where the developer can book such an isolation segment. The service takes care about assigning all the placement tags and everything that is necessary, and if the developer pushes an application to that space flagged with such a service, the application gets delivered in the correct isolation segment. That was one of the challenges we're facing. The other one was we told you we put Cloud Foundry right in the middle of the data center, so we put it really deep in the data center. So how can we integrate it with everything we have already in the data center? So just let me show you what the data center of Dadev looks in a great higher overview like. We have that internet, that cloudy thing. We have authentication authorization gateways, and we have HTTP routing tiers. And behind these routing tiers, we already had JE and .NET application servers. And what we did, we put Cloud Foundry right beside our existing application servers which actually means the Cloud Foundry domains are not accessible at, at first. So we have to solve different things. HTTP routing. How can we achieve a self-service that a developer pushing an application to Cloud Foundry gets a route that this application will be accessible from the internet via the existing gateways? The other one was about how connecting to legacy services to all the existing services we already have in the data center. And what about logging, monitoring, and all the stuff we need? Well, as you suppose, we created services in the marketplace for that. One service was HTTP routing as a service. The developer can book this service, and it creates exactly this route that is necessary that the application can be called from the outside world. Another, another service we bought, we called it legacy as a service because it's not only one service, it's more than one. We created services for creating DB2s on the mainframe. We're utilizing IBM COSMF, and that helps us to create on-the-fly DB2s on the mainframe system. So the DB2 at Datev becomes just as, as any other Postgres. The developer can book it, gets its own user, its full DB admin access, and can use this DB2 just like a Postgres or any other database. And also we created services for accessing all the legacy backends we have, which they are not not even a protocol name to access them, but we have them in the data center, and we want to access them for, from Cloud Foundry as well. Another thing is monitoring. Also a service, the developer can decide if, it want, if he wants monitoring or not, and he can book the service. We have a huge infrastructure from CA Wiley. Well, actually, it's CA APM at the moment. They always change the name. Um, and the developer can opt into that and say, OK, my, I want my application to be monitored. And all these monitoring data, it's the same infrastructure we use on the other platforms. So the developer can match the data generated by the Cloud Foundry applications and compare it and um, compare it with any other application running on any other platform. So it gets a full view of the complete data center on all the applications, no matter what platform they are. And we did exactly the same with Splunk. We use Splunk for logging. So we also integrated Cloud Foundry and all the logs Cloud Foundry produces in the Splunk system. So you can check what can see your application logs and all the infrastructure logs around it, even down till the firewall logs. So if you check for a problem, you have all the logs there. And what's important, these logs are visible to all Dartif, cust uh, to, to all Dartif developers. Everyone in Dartif can see all these log data and all these monitoring data. The ops guys do not see any more than the developers see. And that was one key point which is really important for us. Also, we thought about, well, going the cloud native way, developing new applications is one part. But we have that huge infrastructure. We have IIS. We have exist many existing JE applications, about three to 400 JE applications running on a traditional WebSphere cluster. We will have the need to port them. But these applications are created, and they rely on specific Things like naming conventions, like files in the file system, which exists. They write logs in the file system because we told the developers always, don't use standard out. You have 20 applications on one application server. If you use standard out, no, more, no one will know which logs are from what process. So we told them to use log files. But if you want to write log files in a Cloud Foundry environment, it's, well, not that good, actually. Um, so we created a build pack. We created our own build pack. And this build pack 
helps us to fill this gap. This build pack creates an environment for the application that the, the existing K2E application has zero to no migration effort, almost no migration effort. The applications can be ported to Cloud Foundry, and the build pack takes care about generating the application server configuration, about taking the logs which are written to the file system to a Splunk, for example, and all the other things that are necessary. And with this build pack, we can achieve that JE applications at Dativ can be run on any application server, no matter it's classical WebSphere, it's Cloud Foundry, WebSphere Liberty actually in Cloud Foundry, or if it's even a CICS or Kick system on the mainframe where also a WebSphere Liberty application server runs. And this really helps us to keep the door open for any existing applications to be ported to Cloud Foundry. So I will hand over to Andreas. Okay, to thanks do the again. Stuff. <laughs> uh, now, what are the other plans and uh, where are we now? Uh, first, where are we now? We started in January 2017 with setting up Cloud Foundry. Uh, in April, our uh, development environment was ready. So, so pilot projects began to do this, and in September, production was live. Uh, what we achieved is that now we have these product teams uh, enabled that they can really work self-sufficient on the platform. Uh, the interference with administrators or the support of administrators is very much reduced. Uh, on the other hand side, we not only have now JE as application, but also we now uh, go into the direction of Spring Boot and so on, and we support Windows, and we even have now a colleague who has written his application in Go. Uh, because he said, I'm doing some kind of credentials stuff, and so Go is my language. And, okay. uh, we have, Jürgen has presented some of the marketplace entries we have. We have a much, much more. Uh, and so our marketplace, and by this also self-service, is growing very rapidly. And this is very important for us. And we see a company-wide adoption of this platform. Currently, we have roughly 950 developers registered for the platforms. One uh, more very active, one less active. But you know, also the whole ed uh, education at Dativ is going into the direction of Cloud Foundry. Uh, OK. These are the numbers we have produced so far. As I said, uh, in April, uh, we started with, uh, with development environment going live, and in September with production. These are the running app instances. One side note, perhaps. Uh, we are using the auto uh, sleep service to, uh, to make or to stop applications which are not needed, and this helps us to reduce resource consumption and also licensing costs. Well, actually, we use Autosleep just in development. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what are our future plans? Uh, as I already said, we want to go into the direction of Spring uh, much more. We want to go into the direction of Windows 2016 applications. We have currently a very big project with Windows at our door front, uh, which will at least require the same infrastructure we have behind this currently running cloud also for this application alone. So this will be a challenge for us and very interesting. Uh, on the other hand side, for the platform, we want to go into the direction of Kubernetes container runtime because uh, we see from the business the, the demand on the one hand side to buy off the shelf products and to run it in our data center. And this uh, will be delivered as Docker containers. So we make to have them integrated into our platform. Uh, on the other hand side, we want to have databases be provisioned as Docker containers. We want to have uh, container networking running. And this is not only for performance, but this is also for security reason, because container networking gives us the opportunity to only uh, make the really needed applications and services externally accessible and the rest can be hidden. And we want to go into the direction of GradHub or Vault because we have encrypted uh, credentials in our platform, but the management of these credentials is still one of the, our main pain points we have. Yeah, these are, um, and so uh, encrypting these credentials and decrypting and so on, this is not the way we would like the platform to behave, and so we go 
into this direction. It's actually one of the points that limits a bit self-services in production because uh, it's always still hard that a developer can, can get the production password for the DB2 instance, for example. Yeah. And that's why we're heavily investing in Cretab or in Vault. Yeah, okay. Uh, what is our channel vision we are following? Uh, it's platform as a product. We, I've heard this term at this conference more than once and it's it's good, so, so we are not the only ones thinking into this direction. <laughs> uh, and it's uh, based on an article or blog post by Engineer Better. The guys have a booth up there already. So uh, they posted it under Post DevOps. I will have the link in it there. And this thinking has influenced also what we want to do. We want, on the one hand side, we want a platform team, which is platform DevOps development and operations in the platform. And so this is very important. This also goes hand in hand with the Google site reliability engineering thinking. You only have, you do not only have operations people in the platform, you also have a lot of development there to make more self-services, to automate it even better. Uh, and this platform team defines a platform contract, for example, by the implementation of self-services. And based on this platform contract, the, all of these application development teams and operation teams, application DevOps teams, they implement their application. So we still have a very clean separation of concerns. The application DevOps teams can run their applications and implement them, but uh, they have a solid platform below them so they can concentrate on the application. This is the focus we have there. Uh, okay, this is the promised link to the colleagues from Engineer Better. Okay, what are the lessons we learned? Is it advisable to deploy PaaS as an island? No, in our experience it's very good to implement it into the existing world because you know if you're building a serious application sooner or later you have to talk to the other systems and implementing paths also into the existing world in my opinion is also very good to take the people who are building or running their already existing systems take them with you so there is no other guys doing something in a corner of their company no, it's all people are involved to bring this platform ahead, and this is important for us. The thinking of post DevOps, as I already said, is important. Uh, to have this clean separation, but to be honest, we have application DevOps teams now knocking at the door of the platform DevOps team and saying, hey guys, you have uh, such a knowledge about these technologies and so on, could you please help us? So one of the things we are now thinking about is implementing uh, um, application support service or having the opportunity for the application DevOps teams that they can book a premium support by the platform teams. So even there, the boundary will now get a little bit open. Cloud Foundry, in our experience, is a much about people's mind. It's not only technology. It, it breaks a lot of barriers down within the company. So if you run such a platform, you have to interact with most of the departments in your company. This is very important for us. And one thing is that now our developers are also beginning to think about day two. There is no barrier anymore where they can take their deployment artifacts, throw it over the wall, and then operations will take care of. No, they, they can see their thing run, they can access it, and, and they see their baby fail. You know? and, and this is very important for, from, the, from the mindset we, we are going to. Okay, next question we also had a lot of discussions with is, you know, as I told you, in January 2017, we began setting up the platform, and in April, we had to deliver. And so we always thought, you know, uh, uh, do we have to take all processes we already have in the existing world, take them over? Do we have the time to modify them? Do we, um, should we take them over with us? And our experience is that you can, should be very careful with this. You, know? uh, um, you have to find a, a balance between taking everything from the old world and implemented in Cloud Foundry, all the old thinking, and then the Cloud Foundry will not uh, live up to its value. On the other hand side, it will take in a company a lot of discussions over, over months you know, with IT security and all these people to get something working if you say we start from zero. 
And the last point is uh, don't underestimate the effort to change everything. You know, in the company, as I said, uh, we to bring Cloud Foundry to life in an existing data center, you have to touch so many points and you have to have so many discussions. Even if you say, okay, we a little bit behave like the old world, this is a lot of effort. But some things stay the same or even get more important. The one thing is monitoring. Cloud Foundry is very good. And also, Jürgen showed two monitoring points we are also integrating. But monitoring such a complex platform and uh, these uh, 12 fact app applications, this is very important. And monitoring is not only about the technology monitoring, but also about monitoring business KPIs. The second point is communication. Our PO, Peter Sieber, is doing an excellent job to communicate constantly about the platform we are building. But this is an effort all in the teams have to do. You know, we have to, so our, also our colleagues who are running the base platform, they are making block entries into, for example, into the block of the development departments and so on. So we are very open on this. And the theme of working together in a company, this is very important for us because you know, Cloud Foundry is not, as I already said, about technology. It's about mindset. And Cloud Foundry not only enables us to a new set of uh, uh, working together, I, in my opinion, it forces us to a new set of working together. And this is, for us, very important. OK. so. This was a very short, very fast introduction, what we are doing. Um, any questions? I know that, that data from the past was very much ITIL oriented. Yes. Yeah. And now you're doing it a very agile way. So yeah. how did you change your processes within data to make uh, that happen? Th 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 this is a good question. Uh, I, I, we, we talked about isolation of things. Our colleagues from the ITIL part and also our operation teams were very much focused to say we need changes and so on because we are not isolated if you break something you know the whole ecosystem might break so so we, you know we had meetings with as much people as here in the room for big change meetings you know and uh, now with cloud foundry where we say this is so much isolated we come from the public cloud area you know from uh, uh, where um, the, the clients are isolated and if this breaks the, this the application, then it breaks itself there, there you know. Uh, so, uh, the, the ch so we ended up that people building applications on this platform do not have to go to the big change meeting. They only are making a doku change, which means I just documented that I changed something so that if something explodes, everybody can see that something changed, but I do not have to, you know, to agree on it. You know? yeah. This is a big change uh, where the technology helped us to bring this forward. But it's a good question. Thank you. And, and even more, this creation of documentation changes is already automated within development pipelines, within Jenkins pipelines. So, so if you push you know, to, to a stage, it's already, already created. So nobody can, can forget it. <laughs> is uh, that build pack, the gateway mm -hmm. drug build pack, Mm -hmm. um, is that available for others? Have you considered contributing to open source? Yeah, we, we, we have this discussion in Dativ internally. Uh, and you know, uh, we have to, how do you say, we have to clarify this with our legal department, how much we are allowed to contribute to the, to the open source. Because in, in our opinion, at least of Jürgen and mine, mm -hmm. we should contribute it. Yeah. Because you, know, we, you cannot always take from a community. You have to, to, to give back something. Actually, yeah. this question is already asked by IBM because IBM was really fascinated about the possibility of porting a WebSphere traditional application as it is to Cloud Foundry, which is already the glue code yeah. between the standard IBM Liberty yeah. build pack and that what we put on top of it. Yeah, but, but to be honest, you know, if you make it publicly uh, uh, available, the, the, then you, you would have to make at least the data specific things, you know, we would have to make this configurable somehow, yeah. you know, be, because n n nobody would ever want to have some data uh, uh, JVM properties or something like this in his environment, yeah. which is understandable. So in, in the classical uh, networking world, you usually have classical security concepts with yeah. security zoning and yeah. uh, firewalling, etc. whereas in, in in the cloud native setting, you, you typically have production workload running in the same platform, or you can yeah. have production yeah. workload running in the same platform as dev workload. Yeah. 
how did you have challenges in this in this area uh, of, of, the, of where these two worlds mm -hmm. were yeah. clashing? Uh, we have uh, we have three foundations. Uh, we, have, we have test Q, QA and broad foundation, which are, are strictly separated from, from a networking point of view. Uh, uh, and, and currently, as Jürgen has uh, shown, the, the isolation segments, they are their uh, own VLANs. So, so, so they are really separated from the other things. So even if you would manage to take over a public uh, application of DATEV and you would manage to break out of the container of the public application into the VM, you know, the, then you would only be able to see the VMs or the Diego cells for the, for the pub, DATEV public workloads. You would not from the firewall, you would not be able to, to go somewhere from there. So we also have the, the, the DATEV, we call it the core isolation segment, where the Diego brain and all of DATEV of the, uh, Cloud Foundry is running. This is also separating its own VLAN, and you can only communicate from the core isolation segment to the public isolation segment, but not the other way around. And so, actually, yeah. no application from DATEV is running in the core segment except the system applications of Cloud Foundry. Yeah, so, yeah, but, but, uh, yeah but, but, but we are Currently, we have a project going on to take this strict isolation with isolation segments and uh, and and uh, these VLANs and all these things to open it up a little bit more, maybe so, so, so that you can at least in the secured areas you can have the policy not on the on this big block of data, you know very highly confidential data and only data you can access with the password, but, but to build more intelligence into the applications or in API gateways or something like this, yeah. to, go, to go a bit above the networking layer. Okay, um, I know data from my history a little bit more before that, well, and um, I've, what I understand is um, that you're running Cloud Foundry for your data center mm -hmm. computing processes, which yeah. means, um, um, your own shops and the processes of the our customer, which sends the data to the uh, uh, data center. Mm -hmm. um, but I think um, the main development, software development of data was in the past on .c and was introduced to .net framework mm -hmm. with the data yeah. workspace. Yeah. And uh, my question is now: Do you plan something like to enable our customers? to go to a cloud or its own Cloud Foundry installation with .NET applications which run on Cloud Foundry? Is this plan something? Uh, because it's the, that's the main software development yeah. or core of your, yeah. Um, well, shifter. if you have a reminder, the keynote this morning, there was this shape of JVE.net and that, that really left a shifted white box. That's actually kind of what Dativ looks like. We have a little on .NET on this platform, but yeah, as you said, we are shipping a lot of software as a DVD to the customers, and a lot of business code. That, that That's why we are investing in Windows Server 2016 yeah. and container isolation, and we want to make Windows 2016 containers first-class citizens in the platform with all the same features to enable all these .NET developers to use the language they're used to and their building tools they're used to but use it on the cloud platform. Yeah. But, 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 but maybe it's... What I, what I yeah. to ask is, um, so that because the Dativ text software yeah. from mm -hmm. the past yeah. Yeah. has some, I will say, more or less performance issues, scalable things yeah. inside, um, it's not yeah. really scalable. Yeah. So um, when you try to start to go mm -hmm. to Cloud Foundry yeah. with this .NET application, yeah. you really enable the bigger customer one yeah. to scale it yeah. directly yeah. because they have really issues with the performance and yeah. so on. Yeah. And is, is, is there, is there, exists there blends? Yeah. Uh, so so, so uh, your, your question touches a lot of different layers of thinking. Yeah. So, 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 so the first one is uh, the, the, we, we at Dativ have a strategy for, for the cloud or online world. Uh, the, so we have scenarios where you have uh, Clients of data of text consultants or B two C market, these are, in our opinion, are native cloud applications. We have to go. And we, nobody will install a data software as a B two C customer, in our opinion. So, so we have to make this cloud native from, from uh, and move very much into this direction. The second thing is uh, the. As you said, in the text, text advisor and so on, the, the installations he currently runs on premise in his own office. Uh, 
yeah, we have the uh, decision that we will make bring them to the cloud wherever it makes sense for the tax advisor. Maybe you know he has uh, he says some data I want to keep locally because it's about my own business and I do not want to have data if I have a way to look into or whatever objections he might have. So we will have, I think, in the future also desktop applications. But, but you know, our uh, target is to, to make all scenarios that make sense to bring it into the data center. For example, we have areas where in, in, in bookkeeping and so on, you know, where the collaboration also between the tax advisor client and the tax advisor uh, also now needs close cooperation, and this has to be online, also from the view of the tax advisor. So th this is something where we, uh, yeah, uh, the, the, in, in five years, not all Dativ applications which are currently running in the tax advisor office will be cloud-based applications. You know, but, but this business area is, let's say, where it makes sense. The other ones, like uh, tax advisor clients or B2C customers, like I, you know, uh, th th this will be. Definitely. Yeah. You mean also this data online and so on as well? Uh, if you say... Uh, will add custom and so on which uses uh, data online features and uh, do, do hmm? transport this also to Cloud Foundry applications then again? Well, it, it depends yeah. where it makes sense, actually. Um, we are not here with Cloud Foundry to, to abandon any other platform we have in the data center. As long as it is makes sense to port it to Cloud Foundry, we will do so. But if it does not make sense or if, if we don't have yeah. the time to do it, yeah. the other platforms are just fine as well. They are also first-class citizens in the data center, so the developer can finally decide which platform yeah. he so, would use. Yeah. So, so, so when you up. say uh, Dativ online, you mean Dativ Unternehmen online, for example? Yes. Yeah. So, so, so also there, you know, uh, we will not, uh, we do not have a date to say Dativ Unternehmen will be moved to Cloud Foundry at the. Uh, 21st of something, you know, but, but, but uh, there, as, as we've shown you, uh, due to the close cooperation between the platforms, you know, the, also these colleagues are saying, I'm now beginning something new and I will start, you know, there, and, and, and we will have to, yeah. So. Okay. Okay. Since, since we're already over time, um, if you have any further questions, we are here at the conference the all day, uh, or feel free to contact us whenever you want. We are happy to answer any questions. Okay. Thank you.